I'm Renee Duresta. I'm a technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. So uh, I'm a mom of uh, three. <laughs> uh, when my first son was born, I had to enroll him in a preschool. And um, this is a routine thing you do in San Francisco. It's not even a nice preschool, any preschool. Um, and, I, uh, and I started looking at the vaccination rates because that was important to me. And I noticed that they were very, very low. And I began, I reached out to my local um, state senator, actually, and I said, hey, can we do something about this? You know, this is kind of ridiculous. I just moved from New York. We don't have this problem there to the same extent. Uh, and they said, no, um, no, we can't really. There's no, no appetite for it. But then the Disneyland measles outbreak happened very soon after. And I called back again and they said, yeah, you know, we are going to do something about this. And I got involved in the process of, uh, of passing a law in California to eliminate vaccine opt-outs. And I was just a mom volunteer. Um, but one thing I did have was a background in data science. And so I started working with other data scientists on mapping networks and trying to understand how the anti-vaccine movement coordinated online. And what I started to notice was that in addition to just sort of uh, protest movement coordination, which anyone can do and is completely fair, uh, there were also ways in which tech platform algorithms were kind of inadvertently amplifying the most sensational content possible. And I was very interested in how tech platforms might be amplifying these conspiracy theories inadvertently, uh, in part because they were really driven by a desire to show people high engaging, you know, sensational content. And I started doing a lot of work trying to understand the mechanics of that dynamic. Um, and that was uh, kind of my first exposure to understanding how narratives moved online, uh, how activists use them in legitimate and illegitimate ways, uh, various tools offered by the platforms. And I was fascinated by the power of the social ecosystem and the way it was fundamentally transforming the way that we communicated and really directly impacting the kind of policies and politicians that, uh, that we were winding up with. One thing that we started realizing was that uh, this was actually a systems problem, right? So the issue was in how communication architecture was designed. It was in how algorithms chose what content to curate, what content to amplify, uh, how things like the trending algorithm pointed people in certain directions, and then ways in which uh, those who wanted to manipulate those algorithms actually had a very easy, uh, a very easy time doing it. This is back in 2015, 2016. So I wound up uh, being asked to work on some of the counter ISIS effort. Really at this point, everybody knew that ISIS was using Twitter to recruit. They knew that there were these kind of networked groups that were trying to get ISIS content spreading regularly. And by this point, um, a few folks have begun to make the connection that this was actually quite similar to what we were just seeing domestic activists do also. And around the same time, uh, Adrian Chen had just written his article called The Agency about the Internet Research Agency in Russia. And so all of a sudden, there was this sort of third component. There was the idea that state actors were using this as well. And not a lot of people, unfortunately, connected the dots at the time. Uh, there were a few folks in State Department and DOD, obviously, uh, who were very aware of it because it had serious national security repercussions, particularly the terrorists and the state actors. There were folks like me who had, you know, happened to work on a couple of these different actor types. Uh, and ultimately, I think what it showed us was that this was a set of tools that anyone could use. It was low cost, low friction, and highly, uh, highly effective at influencing people and shaping what people were talking about. So it was a, uh, again, the realization that this was a systems problem, not just an anti-vax problem or a Russia problem, uh, but that this was actually, in fact, a wholesale manipulation of the information ecosystem. make sure that the internet continues to be a place where people have freedom of expression. And that includes people who have, you know, domestic activists and protesters and people with legitimate grievances who use these tools much the same way. They want to risk designing policies or changing things that would um, interfere in those very, very legitimate protest movements. There's a couple areas, though, where as we've worked on policy over the last uh, four and a half years on this now, where we've come to a couple of ways of thinking about the problem. The first is uh, ideas of authenticity. If you're using manipulative tactics to get things trending, like large quantities of fake accounts or other types of uh, manipulation where there's some sort of gaming of the system 
that falls under what we consider like inauthentic behavior, right? And so uh, you can have domains that are spun up just to create sensational moments. Um, and again, it's this idea of can we understand intent and authenticity in the conversation? So Russia creating fake Black Lives Matter groups, of course, is inauthentic uh, and should be taken down. The problem is really what do you do when it comes down to uh, domestics? And that's where I think a lot of the conversation has been right now. Um, in part because, again, you do want to have that freedom of expression. Health misinformation of the anti-vaccine sort, that's considered kind of a separate class of misinformation. And that's because things that can have a demonstrable negative impact on people or society in a very material way, like right now in the midst of the pandemic that we're in, health misinformation can be fatal. Right, telling somebody go drink bleach or you know um, don't wear masks or other types of manipulation, uh, other types of malinformation have really serious consequences for the public. And so the platforms have decided uh, that that kind of content, health misinformation in particular, deserves to be treated uh, distinctly as a as a topic that actually does merit fact checking and looking at the narrative uh, on its points. We don't do that for political misinformation, we do it for health misinformation. I think there's a real challenge there, right? Which is that there's a bright line for foreign manipulation. Uh, it's, it's very few people in a democratic society would defend it. Uh, and so it isn't really a, a thing that we talk about is that you know, Russia's right to free expression to push out fake Black Lives Matter pages is not a, it's not a violin you hear people playing very often, right? Um, so the challenge becomes, uh, how do you create policies that address the one without stifling the other? And that's the real hard conversation that I think we're having as a society right now that we weren't even four or five years ago. I don't think that they over-invested in addressing foreign manipulation. Uh, literally just three days ago, um, my team at Stanford did an analysis on China. Chinese state actors that were uh, fake accounts up on Twitter um, that were pushing a range of narratives. And what we saw there was a lot of narrative management, we can call it maybe, um, around COVID-19, around the Hong Kong protests, around the Taiwan election, uh, around certain prominent figures who are Chinese dissidents. Uh, and what you see there is, again, this commitment by a well-resourced state to run full spectrum propaganda operations that range from the attributable, meaning things that their own minister Twitter accounts are saying, uh, to the sort of subversive or surreptitious, where accounts begin to participate in conversations to try to nudge public opinion in a particular direction. And that's a form of manipulation. I mean, there's a lot of high value targets, right? It's a 2020 election in the US is a, is a huge one. Um, we saw a lot of interesting, um, interesting dynamics play out around protest movements in the US recently also. You know, anytime there's social unrest anywhere in the world, uh, there are people who have a vested interest in nudging things in one direction or another. Sometimes it's economically motivated. You know, we see spammers running fake Facebook lives from Pakistan pretending to be you know, on the ground with a camera in Minnesota. Of course, they're not. Uh, so there's a lot of, again, you have state actors, you have domestic activists, you have, you know, terrorists and non-state organizations, you have um, kind of committed ideologues, uh, anti-vaxxers, you know, a whole range of different groups. The point is anyone can do this and everyone is, right? And that's where the, the, the trend becomes more, how do we think about managing and mitigating it? How do we think about educating the public, um, how do we think about refining the ways in which uh, platforms curate the content that we see? I think that's actually one of the huge things that we're gonna be seeing in, uh, in, in 2020 and probably for the subsequent two years actually we'll be thinking about the platform actively decides what to surface. So I think that uh, we'll be seeing conversations about the technology, about the social impact of the technology, and probably I, I would say the geopolitical impact as well. You know, how do we how do we treat these things from a geopolitical point of view uh, at a state level?